term woke seems to be thrown out a lot these days when it comes to games. Right off the bat, I can say that Saints Row isn't a woke game. The cast of Saints Row has always been diverse, featuring characters of different ethnicities, backgrounds, and backstories. So I don't think that argument is very valid when it comes to Saints Row 2022. I've also seen a lot of reviews claim this game is bad, and while I do agree with this sentiment, they don't go into detail as to why this game is bad. Luckily for you, that's what I'm here for. And although there are some things that this game does well, allow me to start this review by breaking down what makes this game bad. I've been following Saints Row very closely since the beginning of the marketing, and to say it has been rocky would be the understatement of the century. Community managers giving snarky remarks to fans, blacklisting Saints Row YouTubers that have spent 10 plus years covering content on this game, and much more. I can commend them for not backing down from rebooting the series, and being confident enough to say that publicly. I sure hope the game can live up to those words. Well, about that. Saints Row can be broken down into three main categories that we will take a deep dive into throughout this video. Storyline, gameplay, and extras. Storyline. Let me start by saying, I think the character I hate the most, well, no, that's Kevin, but I think the character that I hate the second most is me, the boss. The player you control this game is by far the worst rendition of the boss in terms of personality, voice acting, and actions they take within the game's story. The very first line my character said was delivered so bad, I knew I had to change my boss's voice right after the first mission ended. The sad part is, though, when I changed my character's voice, it didn't get much better. What is this? It's not board game night. After hearing the boss talk about horse testicles, I knew we were in for a treat, but no one has rebooted like this before, right? <sighs> In Saints Row 2, your player is a serious person. There is no fucking around with him or her in the game, and it is made very clear from the start. Just shut up and listen. Gat was looking into a Japanese crime boss called the Kuji. This guy's coming into town soon, and I want to know when. Got it. Don't fuck this up, Pierce. I'm not in a good mood. So going into this game and hearing countless articles and interviews via Volition explaining that this game's narrative tone is set between Saints Row 2 and Saints Row the Third's narrative had me very hopeful that there would be some powerful lines and scenes in the game. It was all a fucking lie. What sort of waffle maker can I get for 35 bucks? Uh, presumably one that makes fucking waffles? Mm -hmm. Hey! <laughs> hey! The Wave Slave is back! How was your first day? Were the other mercenaries nice to you? Wait, no. L let me fix that for you. W what sort of waffle maker can I get for 35 bucks? Uh, presumably one that makes fucking waffles. Hey! <laughs> hey! The wave slave is back! How was your first day? Were the other mercenaries nice to you? That's just the very beginning, too. The story doesn't let up on the cringe. It's bad. It's really bad. I just can't fathom the fact that Volition sat around a table, reviewed the script with each other through multiple grown adults, and thought, yeah, they'll love this. At one point, there was a glimmer of hope of a serious moment in the Codex mission where you get fired, but it then cuts to immediate silliness through the Depression mission. Look, I know video games aren't supposed to be taken serious. You're supposed to be having fun playing video games. But if you had to sit through this for a 15 hour playthrough, you'd start to get a little aggravated too. This is gonna be an epic statement. That yacht's guarded AF. Dude, can you just say AF? Yeah, it's an abbreviation. First, we fucking swear all the time. Second, it's only an abbreviation when you text. AF. As fuck. Same number of syllables, dumbass. Okay, fine. This is going to be an epic statement because that yacht is guarded as fuck. There's so many fucking examples. Nina mentioning the Pantero's gang group chat, Kevin one-liners, the LARPer missions. Oh god, the LARPer missions. Where do I begin? Somewhere in the middle of the story during the time you are running the startup of the Saints, you are introduced into the LARPer missions through Eli. I don't even know why or how this relates to the story. When I first saw this, I was in utter disbelief. I thought, N no, they're, they're fucking with me, right? A LARPer mission in the main story, but I thought this game was supposed to have a middle ground between Saints Row 2 and 3. It gets worse. There are three main missions regarding this in the story, plus a full criminal venture that you must complete to unlock the third and final mission. I was ready to rage quit the reboot right here and then. I couldn't though, because I know there's some poor bastard out there that thinks this game has a chance of having a compelling narrative, so I have to be here in order to tell you that it doesn't. The LARPer missions are by far one of the worst aspects of this game. The missions suck, they drag on for 
for far too long. You're forced to use shitty weapons. The dialogue is cringe. Ah, maybe I should stop. The point is, this LARPing stuff should have been cut out from the game. It's simply a waste of memory. Is this the reason why we don't have rain? At the very least, it should have been hidden as a side mission. Here's a list of things I'd rather be doing than playing these LARPer missions. So I know the Saints Row 2 comparisons are a bit played out at this point to some people. So let's do other comparisons. I'd argue that the boss's personality in Saints Row the 3rd is better than the reboot boss as well. More of a serious tone, and when there is silliness, at least it has some charm to it. Hell, I'd even argue that the Saints Row 4 boss is better. At least he can fight. In the reboot, I don't think your boss wins one fight on screen. He or she is constantly being beat up. Alright, you're tired of people using cringe as an example of why the story is bad, right? Well, let's pretend none of this cringe exists anymore, and let me break down why the story is still a poor one. For one, the saints go through very little trials and tribulations together. Off the top of your head, what is the most impactful moment of this game? When Nina gets her car destroyed? Maybe. Giving Kevin his happy meal he wanted since he was a kid? You know, when he started talking about him being an orphan, I kind of felt bad for him for a split second. But then we went on to murder thousands of people together, presumably which some had kids, thus creating a bunch of orphans himself. Let's take the focus off the main saints for now. Let's discuss the rival factions of the game. Let me just start by saying Sergio, the leader of the Panteros, is Philippe Lorenzo. 2.0. I'd actually argue that Philippe Loren was a more in-depth villain. You don't know anything about Sergio other than he's a big bad man that Nina doesn't like. There are no cutscenes that portray his personality to give him more character depth. There are no instances that you see him talking to the other lieutenants of the gang to give the Panteros some more substance. And overall, the only time you see him other than his death scene is when he destroys Nina's car. The boss doesn't say a single word to Sergio the entire game. Not to mention you aren't even the one who kills him. You get pushed and bitched around like you always do in this game as soon as you and Sergio have their first face to face encounter. No epic boss battle, just one cutscene, boom, Sergio's gone forever. Tell Philippe Loren I say hello. I don't have much to say about the idols because they technically have no leader. Just a couple of more important lieutenants called the Collective, in which you never reveal who's under the masks, and once again there is no character or gang development. You don't see the gang slowly fall apart like you would in Saints Row 1 and 2, just one second they are there, and one second they are not. There's not even a final cutscene or mission that claim the gangs are finished. You just get a call from one of your homies saying that the gang is falling apart, and to call them back when you want to finally finish them for good but you aren't even given an option to follow through with that. The only faction that got some screen time, as minimal as it may have been, is Marshall. At least you see Atticus a couple times throughout the game. But by the time you start to see him get angry because of the saints interrupting his business and putting a dent in Marshall, boom, he's shot dead. Myra Star is appointed next in line for Marshall, and that's the end of that, I guess. It's a shame because the gangs had a lot of potential this time around. They just lack the heavily needed exposition that would indicate what kind of people these gang leaders are. The gangs all blend into each other in terms of depth, and by the end of the game I felt like I was fighting the syndicate all over again. I'm just thankful they do firefights different from one another, but that doesn't excuse the poorly written characters. Another example of something that simply doesn't make sense is the character Gwen, who had decent potential of becoming a heel during the campaign. It starts pretty well, by her bossing you around at Marshall, giving you orders, and treating you poorly. After I left Marshall, I was thinking to myself, oh yeah, Gwen's gonna get hers, I can't wait. Well she did, just not in the way you'd expect. Did we crush her with a monster truck? Nope. Did we have an epic sword fight that leads to a massive explosion? Nope. Was there at least a cool death scene? Absolutely not. For some godforsaken reason, Gwen is part of the LARPing story arc. And yeah, that's how her story comes to an end. There's just so much random shit that happens in this game. The pacing is just weird. One second I'm doing an epic train heist with my crew, which by the way is by far one of the best missions of the game. It felt like such a change in tone in terms of dialogue, intensity, and overall feel compared
compared to 90% of the game. I absolutely loved this mission. The Nuwali is a total badass, and although the money fight after the mission is just so dull witted, overall, like I said, I enjoyed the mission. Which is why the next mission where you are collecting random pieces of art for Nina makes such little sense. Why is this mission happening at this point in the story? This really should have been somewhere earlier. Like I said, the pacing is just so random. Here's the thing though, it's not just the pacing of the game, it's the actual mission scripting too. It's just strange. The best way I can describe it is very last gen feeling. To preface, I know nothing about scripting, but take this sequence right here and tell me if you think there's something missing. Shit, the cops found us. Let's show them how the Saints do it. Fight as a team. It's like it's missing polish. I don't know, a police ambush scene, a quick time event where your character is realizing you guys fucked up big time, anything to make it a bit more polished feeling. Oh well, back to the characters. There's one character I like in the game, and that's Nuwali. Very minimal cringe dialogue, and an actual badass. The mission where you have to break him out of prison is intense. The music hits good, and overall the aesthetic and feel of the mission is just such a shift in tone of what you're used to of the game at this point. I think Nuwali actually makes me hate the other characters even more than I already did. Not hearing people crack cringy jokes, quips, and one-liners throughout the entire mission was so nice to hear. Now that we got that out of the way, let's talk about the last mission. I think I could make a separate video on this mission alone because of how much goes on and how much there is to say. Firstly, what the actual fuck? Llamas, donkeys, snails? Okay, hold up. Let's rewind. It actually starts out awesome. I think the surprise of Nawali stabbing you can take some people by surprise. That is, of course, you didn't watch the story trailer where Volition spoiled that he would. But yeah, the cutscene where you are being buried alive is really well done. But then the acid trip starts happening. You enter this different world to represent that you are dying and I can actually applaud the effort to do something outside of the box and try something different. But the mentioning of board games, the cringe characters that I don't even like, and the snickerdoodle attack all combined makes me disengaged with everything and makes this mission that is supposed to be an intense spectacle just come off as lame. You're right. I am late. I just can't remember for what. All right. Game night. Not to mention the Nuwali turning on you would have been a lot more impactful if we actually saw him for more missions. You don't really get a chance to build that camaraderie with him, thus making his betrayal have a lot less weight. Also, why the fuck does Nuwali force the other saints into role playing house with him after he tries to kill you? I thought this would have been explained, but no, it's not. It makes no fucking sense. If he's a psycho killer, why does he do this? Was this some sort of sick revenge fetish from him? I just don't get it, it doesn't fit his character at all. But anyways, fast forward to a pretty awesome boss battle, you kill him, and boom, the game is over. And the saints are back to their cringe selves. No. If anything happened to you guys, I- Hey, we love you. <sighs> I love you guys too. That's because we're fucking awesome. Here, here. <sighs> I can't believe before the game came out there was a sliver of hope in my mind that by the end of the game these characters would go through some serious growth and become different people. Ugh, I was so naive. I feel like I need to play Saints Row 1 and 2 story to cleanse myself from this garbage. Who wrote this shit? Okay, now let's discuss the 100% true ending. On second thought, it's probably best I don't. You know, my buddy and I were so flabbergasted, so dumbfounded by the writing of this game, we had to dig a little deeper and figure out just how we got into this situation for our beloved Saints Row. After further research, I was able to come across multiple of the writers of this game, and while I will not say their names to protect their identities, I believe we must take a deep dive into their portfolios of games they've worked on in the past to truly grasp their experience in the video game writing industry. After snooping around in the credits, I was in shock when I found out some of the other games the devs have written for. Corny mobile games, cuckold simulator ripoffs, and romance novels. I think the most disheartening thing to see on that list is that the lead writer has never written for a Saints Row game prior to this one. He has written for Agents of Mayhem though. When you combine all of these things and really take into account the story we got, the characters, the dialogue, everything, it all starts to make sense. 
I love you, but I'm allergic. Let's move on to the second infinity stone of this review, the gameplay. Right off the bat, there's plenty of good things about the gameplay, and plenty of things that annoyed me as well. We'll start with some of the negatives, or as Flippy would say, the sad sads, and work our way to some things we can credit the game for positively. I think the very first thing you'll notice the second you boot this game up is that the combat and the gunplay just feel off. I've heard people say it's because of the dead zones on your thumbsticks if you're playing controller, others claiming that you have to adjust your aim assist settings, and some others saying that it has to do with the difficulty settings of the game. Well, regardless of what it is, by default, right out of the package, this game's combat system feels odd. For someone like myself, who will spend hours tweaking the vast options they lay out for the player trying to get the feel of the game just right for my liking, it's not the biggest deal in the world. But to your average consumer, the ones that look at this game on the Steam, <coughs> sorry, I mean Epic Game Store, and pick it up because they like the box art, they might struggle with it more than us. But like I said, we have a vast array of options to tweak, full buttons to map, hideable HUDs and health bars, reticle sizes and colors, and quite a lot more to help us find a playstyle we deem best fit for ourselves. Everyone will be different in this regard. One of the biggest complaints I have about this game is the immersion breaking things that are constantly happening to you as you play through it. For example, when you talk to certain side characters, after the conversation ends, they disappear out of thin air into the depths of hell, or certain missions have very strict boundaries on where you can and cannot go. Why the fuck am I failing a mission to get Kevin a happy meal three times in a row? Who was the developer that thought extremely strict mission boundaries were a good thing? Or how in the beginning of the story, the very second after the saints are created, the enemy gang somehow refers to you as a saint with their battle lines. Party safe. Okay, hold up. At this point, I gotta stop. I'm nitpicking tiny things. Sorry, everyone. I just get in my Saints Row zone and I try to find answers for everything we have in this game. I get it. We can expect absolute realism for these games, but at the same time, I will continue to say that these mission boundaries are way too strict and I shall die on this hill. On a more positive note, I can appreciate the fact that after almost everything you do, not just including the missions, you unlock something. This game is always rewarding you. Exploring dumpsters finding hidden shooting galleries, hidden bricks of coke around the map, will all eventually reward you with some pretty unique stuff. I haven't got this sense of a rewarding feeling since the heydays of Saints Row 2, so I can really appreciate this. The same applies for the various criminal ventures that can be placed around the map in different locations depending on your preference. The criminal ventures sound great on paper, but in practice a lot of them underdeliver immensely. I have broken the CVs into categories, according to my personal preference, good and bad. Trigger warning. A lot of these CVs are just so repetitive. Drive to point A, kill waves of enemies, drive to point B, rinse and repeat. There are standout ventures in that simply because it offers a new experience. A perfect example is the Yerkabator venture. You are given multiple unique weapons to try out that you unlock afterwards. It's simple and effective. Some of the other ventures just feel like gameplay padding. 14 separate times where I have to drive the toxic waste truck back into the bright future venture for very little cash. It's not just the bright future. A lot of them are very tedious and feel like artificial grinding in terms of using up hours of your time. First Strike Dojo and Let's Pretend are two prime examples of ventures that have great promise but simply lack delivery. I don't even think the dojo would have been as bad as it was if it wasn't for the busted ass melee system. I found myself actually enjoying the more simple ventures a lot more than the others. Jim Robs is basically just chop shop from previous games and I'm more than okay with that. Stealing some nice rides around Santa to Aleso was actually fun. Shady Oaks insurance fraud was one of my favorites too. It plays extremely different this time around and I actually quite like that. It's a good change of the iconic activity and it feels like the evolution of insurance fraud with the new ragdoll system. Planet Saints was one of my favorites as well because of how quickly you can complete it. It doesn't feel like an artificial grind and on top of that you unlock one of the coolest interiors and stores in the game. Ooh, look at those big ass chains. I think there's a great foundation in the soil of these criminal ventures. Whether it was a memory issue, time constraints, or something else on why so many of them are repetitive, grindy, or lackluster, I guess we'll never know. The side hustles aren't too bad. My favorite was actually Pony Express because it was the closest thing we have to a racing activity. This time you're racing against the clock while given a unique vehicle. 
you know how I love my unique vehicles. Other than that, I didn't really care for riding shotgun or the wingsuit one all that much. The thing that made activities, side hustles, criminal ventures, whatever you want to call them special is that in previous Saints Row games, they would switch up the gameplay pretty dramatically. It's stuff you wouldn't be able to do in the open world. That's why I feel a handful of ones in this game fall so flat. It's stuff you can already do in the open world. How would driving to point A, then killing waves and waves of enemies be more entertaining than a demolition derby that you can participate in? They do seem to have gotten it right with the Hitman activity though. There were moments I felt myself enjoying the Hitman activity through my phone more than the actual story and criminal ventures. It's a good change of pace. There are unique scenarios, and the characters you meet are pretty fleshed out. This one time I had to pretend to be a limo driver for two gentlemen named Giuseppe and Bruno, who have been cheating at Dom's casino. What makes this so engaging is the dialogue between these two random characters. Bruno! How's business? Couldn't be better. Very lucrative. I busted flush. Maybe be a little careful. It's one of Dom's. So what if it is? Dom hasn't caught on yet. True enough. Couldn't do much if he did catch on. Toothless old coot. Ah, he's lost his edge. All he wants to do is sit around and smoke cigars and reminisce. So long ago, we came to Santa Ileso. Young men together. <laughs> he never had any edge to lose. He was an idiot back then, too. I was more engaged with these two than I was with any dialogue between the main Saints cast during the story. It also made me quite sad there was no Italian wise guy voice to play as. Ugh, now I want a Giuseppe and Bruno Casino DLC that shows the rise of these two. The unique scenarios this activity throws you in makes it memorable and you always want to continue to do the next target. One time I was battling another monster truck in a monster duel. The next time I was out with grandma letting her blow the guy using her credit card's brains out. It was awesome. Take that, you goddamn millennial! Good lord, Boomer! Customization is another aspect they got right. The gun customization can work really well when you get the hang of it. You can make your own custom camos and skins for the weapons. All the different combinations add longevity to this feature. Although I do kind of miss the vast array of weapon skin options from Saints Row 4, this isn't a bad trade-off. Currently, there's an annoying bug that resets your custom camo every time you quit the game fully and load it back up, which can get pretty aggravating if you've spent a considerable amount of time making a camo. I can only hope this gets fixed soon. In terms of car customization, they really outdid themselves this time around. Credit where credit is due, car customization is on par with GTA 5 this year and I couldn't be happier about that. I have an entire video dedicated on this feature alone on my channel, so feel free to watch that when you get a chance. I do find myself getting a bit depressed when I see the plethora of customization options for vehicles, knowing Volition missed such a golden opportunity to bring back street racing and perhaps evolve the activity further. It's an actual crime you can make a car this sexy and not be able to race it through the streets via an actual sanctioned race. It breaks my heart to see. You can also customize your aircrafts and boats to a surprisingly well fleshed out degree, so that's another plus. Not only is the car customization great, but the actual driving mechanics are too. I think it's got to be the smoothest it's ever been in the series. Another plus is how destructible all the little objects on the map are. It can make car chases really intense. Speaking of which, the Cops are psychos in this game. Pit maneuvers, rams, they are really aggressive in trying to take you down. Overall, as mixed as the gameplay is and can be, I think once you get the hang of it, there's some fun to be had while playing this game. I went back to Saints Row the Third to see if I was tripping out and overreacting when it came to the aiming and combat of this game. I was met with reassurance and also depression when I realized how much smoother running around and shooting in that game truly feels compared to the reboot. It's now time for your third and final pillar of this review, and that's extras. If you're wondering what this is in regards to, it's about the world, map, NPCs, and every other little detail that make up an open world game. Let me get this off my chest right away. Santo Aleso is better than Steelport, and that's a fact. It's a beautiful map to look at. Each district actually feels unique from one another. This is something Volition was clamoring about from the very first time they revealed the map, and I'm glad to say it wasn't a lie. There are so many moments I find myself getting lost in the cinematic scenes while I drive around. I think this is the reason why it took me so long to 100% complete the game, because I'd load it up, hop in a vehicle, and appreciate the beauty of this map. The cat 
I see a lot of reviewers saying that this game is really ugly looking. When hearing that, I kind of just thought to myself, have they ever played a Saints Row game before? Sure, it's no Red Dead 2, but for a Saints Row game, I gotta say, this game does have its pretty moments. That's not to say sometimes it doesn't look like shit, but hey, I'm not a stickler when it comes to graphics. How I can best describe Santo Aleso is your typical Instagram model with millions of followers. Very beautiful looking on the outside, but when it comes to what's on the inside, it lacks any depth whatsoever. The amount of unique interiors on this map is actually pathetic. I almost want to laugh when I think about it, but the more I do think about it, the more it makes me want to cry. Why is there no enterable casino in the El Dorado district? Why is the prison interior locked off after the prison escape mission? Why are so many stores just kiosks outside? Why the fuck can I still see the interior loaded from the LARPer death scene, but I can't fucking go inside? Well, the real answer is memory issues. According to Volition, they had some serious memory issues when it came to programming interiors and whatnot. Okay, okay, that's fine and dandy, but if memory was the issue, then why the fuck did we get five LARPer missions? Okay, calm down RPG, breathe. It's just a game. But in all seriousness, if memory was the actual reason why this map is so heavily devoid of interiors, then why waste that precious space on those stupid filler missions? There is a giant dome in this game. Why is there no demo derby? Is it because it unlocks with DLC? What would you guys rather have for the game? LARPer missions or a shopping mall? LARPer missions or a casino? The list can go on and on, but you get my point. Like I said, Santo Aleso is very pretty, with a rich lore scattered around the entire map, lots of beautiful artwork, and a balanced mix of Las Vegas, Arizona, Texas, and LA throughout the entire map. It's very unique. The NPCs are better than Saints Row 3, but no, they are not better than Saints Row 2. This isn't my nostalgia rose-tinted glasses either. This is facts. I'm happy they upgraded the peds in this game, but it wasn't a giant leap forward like I was hoping it was going to be. Still, you can find a decent amount of variety when exploring, but overall, especially when you're driving a car, I think the ped density should be turned up by double to truly give it that next-gen experience. There are some very questionable open-world choices. I'm sure you've all seen the videos by now that shows off the fact that you can't rob stores or kill the tellers, whether that was a design choice because of memory issues, or because killing store clerks is offensive nowadays, we'll simply never know. The random events are actually pretty cool. I was driving around and I saw what looked to be a car wreck after the vehicle flipped over with the EMS attending the driver. The first time you see the peds lighting the fireworks off in the open world is a nice treat, but after the 800th and 76th time, it starts to lose a bit of its charm. I kid you not, go drive around the desert, you will see that fireworks event quite frequently. I actually appreciate how many different clothing stores there are, with all unique items making each store feel individual from one another. Reminds me of Saints Row 1 and 2. It encourages exploration of the map, and that's a common theme in this game. A lot of people have been asking me about the in-game radio stations, and while I will say that they are mid at best, I was watching a YouTuber one day, and he ranked the Saints Row radio stations on a tier list. I think it's time to completely steal this idea and do the same for the illustrious stations of the reboot. Keep in mind, this is all subjective, and this is my personal opinion while playing through the game. Surprisingly enough, Outrun comes at S tier for me. I gotta say, I didn't even know what the hell Synthwave was prior to playing this game, but for some reason, I enjoyed this station quite a bit. For A tier, we have Cypher. Old school hip hop is one of my favorite genres of music, and this station actually has some bangers. Nuclear Blast, Tumbleweed Radio, and Funk Flex for B tier. I was actually shocked to put Tumbleweed this high on my list. I usually hate country music, but playing this game, listening to some old western while cruising in the desert, it was a vibe. Also, shout out for getting trippy red as one of the hosts of Funk Flex. I thought that was really cool. C stands for classic. Dos Ochos and El Latido for D tier. The Spanish and reggaeton music, not my cup of tea for the selection they chose. In the terrible tier, we have Overdrive and The Drop. Apologies to everyone I've triggered in advance. Let's move on. There's a certain feature that is missing in this game that when I found out was gone, I was in disbelief. It is such a huge gripe of mine that I thought they'd have fixed by now. Why in this day and age is there still no mission replay in a Saints Row game? At the very least, give me a cutscene viewer. I can't go back to try and experience certain missions again or rewatch cutscene. Okay, I probably wouldn't do that, but it's still ridiculous. Even Agents of Mayhem had mission replay that you unlocked after beating the game. I was expected to be greeted with a message after the game that would indicate I've unlocked said feature. It's a huge omission. Not to mention, there's no cheats at all for this game. This one is strange. I hope they don't try and sell it to us as a DLC pack like they have done in the past. This ain't the early 2010s anymore, Volition. People are going to be pissed if you do that. While we're on the topic of omissions in the game, am I the only one upset this 
map has no airport. Also, it has no planes at all, like none. The closest thing we have to a plane is a VTOL, but it's not the same. That's definitely a strange omission, and I'd love to know why we don't have any. You know, deep, 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 deep down, there's a solid foundation in the depths of this game. Volition did listen to some of our wishlists to an extent from back in the day. Layered clothing, a much better map than Steelport, and more grounded gameplay. That being said, they did not listen to the most crucial part of the wishlist, and that was a more serious, compelling story. That reason alone makes me never want to boot up this game again, at least for a while. Thinking about some of the moments in this game's story just makes me shiver with cringe. All in all, I I have no choice but to give the Saints Row reboot a rating of 4 out of 10 RPGs. Like I said, there's a solid foundation deep into this game's core, and Volition has stated that 3 DLC expansion packs are coming in the future where they will have missions and also expand the map. So I think there's a possibility of the game being bumped up to a 4.5 or a 5 down the road. But as it stands right now, yeah. 4 out of 10. The story is simply inexcusable. Newbie. Kev? I wasn't calling you. Don't you get it? You're just not a good enough friend. No. You know, I don't think people realize why so many fans are upset with this game. Sure, the series got out of hand and crazy by Saints Row 3 and 4, but this was a reboot, a chance to start fresh, a new story, new plot, with many promises by Volition stating that this game will be a mix of Saints Row 2 and Saints Row 3. Well, as it turned out, it wasn't. This game is pretty much the Gen Z version of Saints Row 4. Take all the silliness of Saints Row 3 and 4's story, take out all the charm and humor, replace it with millennials writing one-line that they think Zoomers will find relatable, and you have the Saints Row reboot in a nutshell. Overall, this isn't an absolute terrible Saints Row game, but they didn't exactly innovate in anything. I'm not asking them to reinvent the wheel, but some ideas outside of the box wouldn't have hurt. A prequel in the 70s exploring the relationship of Julius Little and Ben King, a direct sequel to Saints Row 2, anything but Kevin, Eli, and Nina for the love of God. So what happens now? Where does Saints Row go from here? Volition fumbled pretty hard with this game and they couldn't afford another bad slip up after AOM. So I guess depending on the sales, only time will tell. I think the most depressing part of all is I don't want this to be the last Saints Row. I love this franchise. I don't know why I do, but I still love it. But at the same time, I don't think Volition is capable of making a good Saints Row game anymore. Let's face it, they haven't made a good Saints Row since 2008. 14 years since we got a quality entry in the series and to that I say, I think it's time I slowly part ways with this franchise. Franchise. Sad part is, a lot of these media outlets will call this game a flop, make a couple hate videos, get a couple hundred thousand views, and move on. While me, a diehard Saints Row fan, a Saints Row YouTuber, is kind of stuck with this series in a way. I just hope you guys stick with me on my journey to explore other games. Until big changes are made at Volition, or if Saints Row's IP is bought by another studio, it's the only thing I can really do. I'll still make videos on things I want to cover, but over time, I think I'm gonna have to slowly phase Saints Row out. And that is what breaks my heart the most. I wait along the borders of disdain Staring in What I would give to be within your arms Drying warm Give me the scent to free syringa tree. No longer a death match. It's final call. You know what? I think Julius was right about you. Lonely voice upon a mountain top. I know the freshness. Shout it out. You can keep your fucking pride and die right now. Or you could be a man. The secrets of a generation told All the lies Blind and riding on the ocean spine The fault of mine Drowning is what I perfected for
Bonne nuit, messieurs. Shouting out.